civilizations. Writer Christopher Hitchens and Sharon Waxman, who's written a book on lost art, are two of the panelists. This is about an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Kalaga of the New York Times, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Time Center for our eighth annual Arts and Leisure Weekend. Over the next hour, we explore one of the most pressing cultural questions of our time, namely, where do the great treasures of ancient art rightfully belong? We are privileged to be joined by three renowned experts on this subject, whose work, whether as journalists, authors, scholars, or leaders of some of the world's great art institutions has done much to shed light on this topic. You will hear much more about these esteemed panelists from our moderator. As a New York Times culture reporter covering classical music and dance, he has reported on everything from the New York Philharmonic's historic trip to North Korea last spring to Elliot Carter's centennial birthday concert at Carnegie Hall last month. This past year, he's also chronicled the exploits of Gerard Mortier leaving New York City Opera, classical music patron Alberto Villar being sent to jail, and on a lighter note, the distracted virtuosi who have inexplicably left their multi-million dollar musical instruments behind in taxi cabs, trains, restrooms, and even front doorsteps. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Dan Waken, and our special guests, James Cuno, Christopher Hitchens, and Sharon Waxman. Hello, everybody. Um, it's good to be here. <clears throat> I've lost my voice this morning, so that means they'll have to talk more than me, hopefully. Cool. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about works of art and artifacts in museums and where they came from, how they got there, and should they stay or should they go. Uh, the, the jumping off point is Sharon's book, Loot, which is uh, sort of a comprehensive look at various issues. Um, and in reading it, I, I came up with sort of two categories of works. One, things that were dug up, torn away, removed in the early 19th century, <clears throat> early 20th century, brought to the great museums in Paris, London, New York, um, and have become part of those museums and sort of part of the fabric of that. Um, the other category are objects that have been found in recent years, things that have been suddenly uh, emerged on the market in 1980, 1990, and find their way into museums and are the subject of a different kind of controversy. So I thought we'd start out with the first category. And we have some slides. and. <clears throat> I'm going to show a series of three slides. Um, if we can go through one, two, and three, and then maybe Sharon can talk a little bit about what they are and, and why they're important. Sure. Well, I think to, to put the, the issues of uh, category one and category two, which is uh, objects that were looted or plundered, otherwise uh, appropriated in the past 200 years ago, 150 years ago, are in fact connected to these uh, restitution battles that we're seeing emerge on the front pages or the culture pages of newspapers and journals and magazines today, which is you, when you have these countries that uh, were the, where these things were dug up, they're called source countries that are now demanding things back. Uh, you have to really go back to the origins of the plunder or of the origins of the creation, the core creation of the great collections of our great museums to understand what's at the heart of this, which is what the book tries to do. So a great example of this is Egypt because Egypt was literally, um, there, some people call it the rape of Egypt. There's a wonderful book called The Rape of the Nile by Brian Fagan, one of the early books on the topic that talk about the, the kind of free-for-all of a, you know, just grab fest that Egypt became in, in the 19th century after Napoleon uh, invaded and conquered and then lost it to the British and his, his, he had a military purpose, of course, for doing so, but in, in the course of doing that, he, dis he uh, brought ancient Egypt to the eyes of Europe, which hadn't kind of been aware of the, wonder, the wondrous beauty of ancient Egypt that we're all kind of familiar with every day, the Sphinx, the Pyramid. Well, these were, these were very vague notions to the Europeans at that time. So um, just to give you an example of the kind of 
uh, outrages, essentially, that happened in the 19th century in Egypt. Um, I was given access to, uh, by, by Egypt's chief archaeologist, his name is Zahi Hawass. If you've seen anything Egyptian, you've seen the guy. He has his Indiana Jones hat, and he's constantly um, very passionately excited, talking about all the beauties of Egypt and what they discovered. And it's usually right before some Discovery Channel special starring him on television. But anyway. Um, Apart of the fact that he loves being in the media, he's right. There's a lot of stuff out there that um, that was taken, that was taken in kind of horrifying ways, and that we're not aware about aware of it. So he gave me access to all of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings, um, which is where the pharaohs were buried. You probably know that. This particular tomb is the tomb of Amenophis III. It has never been opened to the public, um, and I took this photograph in pitch black. Love my camera, um, but you could just see. Um, that's the, like, really thanks to digital technology that I was able to get this image. This is, look at how beautiful, and of course this is not the most, uh, you know, if we had light in the tomb you'd see how vivid the colors are. Amenophis III, one of the great pharaohs, um, and this is him uh, side by side with the various gods, Anubis, etc. And if we can see the next, this slide and then the next one please, you can see how somebody came in in the 19th century and just cut out three of the heads of the pharaoh. Boom, 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 boom. Um, and then let's, we don't know exactly uh, who cut them out, but what we do know is that today, next slide please, they are in uh, the Louvre. And that is the, that is the head of one of those three, and all three of them are in the Louvre. You can go see them today. They're in the Sully Wing. So, um, you know, Zahi Hawass has asked for five major pieces back from Western museums, including the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, the Louvre, the British Museum, and two German museums. This is not, these, these heads are not among the pieces that he's asked for, but you just get a sense of um, the feeling of despoliation that uh, Egyptians who are passionate about archaeology and their past feel when, when the subject arises. Let's, let's give another example of that. Number four, please. Maybe Sharon, tell us what this shows. So this is actually uh, one of the objects that Zahi Hawass does want back. This is the zodiac ceiling, or that wood, that's the replica, it's a, that black blobby thing in the top is a black plaster cast that the Louvre sent to, the, to Egypt in the 19th century um, after, um, I would say an archaeologist, an adventurer and his agent, uh, uh, Jean-Jacques Saulnier, spent 21 days hacking this ceiling out of the Temple of Dendera, which is this stunning temple that stands in the middle of these marshes. The Nile used to flow right up to it. It's 2,000 it's two years old. Um, and it is one of the earliest recorded uh, zodiacs that we have. So if you were to see it better, um, you, you, well, if you see it as it was actually drawn in situ before it was blasted out of there by Napoleon's scientists who came with it, you could really see, you could see Scorpio and Libra. You can actually see recorded an eclipse at a certain time in about 2000, uh, about, about, um, about just before the birth of Christ, essentially. So it's, uh, it's really an amazing piece of history, in addition to being an artifact, and it's in the Louvre today. It took 21 days for the French to hack it out of the ce uh, out of the ceiling, which is on the rooftop of the Temple of Dendera. They finally used um, gunpowder to blast it out, and that's how they got the thing to France. Let, let me ask Jim, um, as a museum director, should these kinds of artifacts be returned to Egypt? Well, first, I think we have to recognize that history is an untidy is untidy, and it's a complicated situation. In this case, it's not just that, uh, and I'm, I'm looking down here because we can actually see the images here in front of us. Oh, yeah. But uh, it, it's not just that the uh, that this period of time in the latter part of the 18th century, early part of the 19th century, was a time in which the Europeans became interested in things ancient. Uh, in Egypt, but it's also at a time in which by virtue of the Europeans becoming interested in those things then that the local peoples became interested as well. They had lived for centuries then amongst these things, but of course they reasonably believed that the values of their civilization, call it, um, began uh, with, with the Prophet, with uh, Prophet Muhammad, and that these pagan artifacts had no relationship to the life they lived or the civilization that they claimed uh, for themselves. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, this was something that was prized in, as, in, as glory of the ancient, uh, uh, of the current Egyptians when the, when the French and the British were there. It was something that came upon later. And in fact, the first, as it were, local history of 
of ancient Egypt was written by an Egyptian who had studied in France and got caught up in the kind of fervor of nationalism uh, in, in Paris and sweeping Europe in the middle part of the 19th century. So it is not, it's, history is never so neat and tidy <coughs> as we would like it to be. And these, these questions of restitution are also questions about how and on what terms might we rewrite history? They're based on the premise that uh, uh, there's a way to correct the imbalances, historical imbalances of power. We want to redress them in some way uh, now. So th I, don't, I, I don't think there's a claim for these objects from, and using them generally speaking, um, uh, that, have, that were removed prior to their laws being against their removal. In other words, we can now go back and say this is 180 years before Egypt passed such a law, so there's no legal reason why they might be returned. Is there, is there a moral reason? Uh, that's the question. Is there a moral reason? On what terms might there be a moral reason? Might it be there's a moral reason because there's some uh, claim that the modern state of Egypt has on the remains of an ancient civilization from which they have long been divorced to which they have no other contact than physical proximity and only more or less physical proximity because the Egyptian empire, of course, was spread much greater than the current Egyptian state. I think the complication, and it's raised in the question asked of this uh, symposium, do these things belong to the, to the civilizations that create them? First of all, there's the big debate and question whether civilizations create anything or whether it's people who create things and then we put them together in the framework we call civilizations. But whether there is, you can map a civilization to the confines of a current state. And I think that those are unequal uh, uh, political uh, realities. Civilization is not political in, in those terms that we're talking about it. The state is political and they don't even share the same geographic the uh, uh, same boundaries, you know, geographic boundaries. So I, I don't see there as a claim. I think the only way these things can be re returned is because it's to the advantage of the current uh, uh, possessor of these. In other, in other words, when the Parthenon Marbles and Christopher's written powerfully on it, will they be returned to, to Athens? Only, I think, if the British government thinks it's in its own best interest to do so. I don't think it's going to be on moral grounds. It's not going to be on art historical or scientific grounds. I think it's a matter of public and political diplomacy. And oh, so what you're saying is that the, the British then, if it's in their interest, they should return the, the marbles because they happen to have No, no, no. I'm saying they will do so only when it is in their interest. I'm not saying should what they, should they or do shouldn't so. Do? I'm just saying that mm. that's the political reality of the situation. Mm. There isn't a legal claim on them, as there's no legal claim on this that can be decided. Uh, it can only be because the possessor, current possessor, thinks it's in their best interest to do so. Well, the. Um but not to usurp your function, uh, Mr. Chairman. But please, I raise But I mean, the I question I was hoping you would ask was, uh, would there be such a thing as aesthetic grounds? If, if we're discussing art, I think the aesthetic should have a role in it. And <clears throat> the case in the, uh, in the instance of the Parthenon, uh, the sculpture of the Parthenon, is precisely that. The committee that I'm a member of in London used to be called the Committee for the Restitution of the Parthenon Marbles. It's now called the Committee for the Reunification of them, and I, I'd just like to say, if I can, a few words about how that nuance matters. I mean, the, the sculpture of Phidias that adorns the, this magnificent building, or did, used to adorn it, um, is carved as a unity. It tells a story. It, it's partly derived from the, the Panathenite procession. Um, there are all kinds of interpretations about how many numbers of human figures there are in it, and whether they are the equivalent of the Greek casualties at a certain famous battle, and so forth. But at any rate, <clears throat> it doesn't make much sense to have one half of them in Athens and one half in London. Um, you can't move the whole of the Parthenon to London, to Bloomsbury. Um, but if, for example, during the Napoleonic Wars, the, um, the panel of the Mona Lisa had been, as did happen to quite a lot of artifacts, um, uh, annexed, plundered, and then sawn in half by somebody, and we knew that one half of it was in a gallery in Stockholm and another in a gallery in Lisbon. I'm pretty sure there would be a mass movement of aesthetic curiosity to see what the two halves would look like if they were put together. And probably the, a strong guess could be made they'd look better um, <laughs> than they do. So, well, I think the same can be said, actually has to be said, of the Parthenon sculpture. Now, there are not very many examples of that. Uh, Sharon's just, just given you, and particularly vivid and beautiful, and if I may say so, very beautifully illustrated. It's, it seems to be perfectly clear that the Louvre ought to say it's a matter of aesthetic wholeness yeah. and can integrity. I, can I disagree with you on this? On this? Uh, I mean, I, I do think the Mona Lisa the example is um, um, 
uh, in, in not, not uh, appropriate in the situation or not relevant because the assumption is that you would have the entire thing and it would be split in two parts and it would come back together as the entire thing. And if that were the case, likely it would be resolved on those terms and the two museums would share them. That would be the, it happens many times. Mm. Uh, in this case and in the case of the Parthenon Marbles, uh, they, the, the Parthenon Marbles, as you know very well, would not be restored in their entirety. There would be f fragments of them restored and there would be great Let's gaps show, and holes. Uh, if we have slide 30, please. And, and so there, and that's the first question, uh, it's not going to be restoring the integrity of the Parthenon itself or of its sculptured program. Uh, but secondly, um, it, there's been no suggestion, and there's, it would be very difficult to do this, uh, to share the entirety between Athens and London. And it's not just London, after all. You know, among, London's got the largest uh, bits of the, of, the, of the Parthenon marbles outside of Athens, but they're also in other places in Europe and so forth. So, it's, it's not quite as yes, easy though, as the Mona actually Lisa. Most of the smaller holders have, have given or are giving yeah, them back. Yeah, exactly. Because of the Acropolis Museum, you're quite right in saying that, the, that they can't be put back on the building um, and that also some of them have been lost. The, whole, the entire thing can't be restored. But you, you will be able very soon to see uh, the whole of the sculpture of Phidias in one place. Or you would be if the British right. government would, in, in a gallery that overlooks the that looks at the part yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, so it's, it's the it nearest roughly, you'll be able yeah. to get to, to, yeah. to a restitution. But it would not it I mean, is I, thing. So can I just make a, a related point, which is about the, the rights of the, shall we call them for now the indigenous, if that doesn't sound too colonial. I mean, the, the Napoleonic expedition to Egypt was a classical orientalist expedition, but it was not just for pillage. It was for enlightenment, for, for um, anthropology. He, he attached his fleet and his army a huge number of scholars, map makers, and so forth. It, it actually was is credited by many Egyptians with having, so to speak, dynamized what had been a very stagnant uh, province of the Ottoman Empire and, and, and brought it into the, in many ways into the modern world. Um, for, for example, there was a Napoleonic officer, his name was Champollion, who came across a stone in the sand, um, a sort of tri a three sided bar. Um, one bar bore Egyptian hieroglyphics and one other Barb or Greek, and I think the other had Hebrew. Demotic. No. Demotic, yeah. Demotic. Demotic. Um, well, it, it was fairly easy to work out from that how to decode Egyptian hieroglyphics, which no Egyptian knew how to do, because the Egyptians of that stage were, were Arabs. So this, they were part of the Arab conquest. Um, so does the modern Egyptian every bit, of, every bit as alien and outside as the, as the Islamic Arab conquest, as would have the French or British one have been. Now, this question is, uh, who are we dealing with? In the case of Greece, it is, to borrow T.S. Eliot's wonderful um, expression, which is it, itself taken from James Joyce, it's in um, After Strange Gods, the same people living in the same place. Roughly, you, you can say of the inhabitants of Attica that their language is pretty much recognizably Greek, and that it's being spoken in the same city on the same peninsula as was Phidias and Sophocles. So that seems to be a rather stronger claim. Um, but why is that any Egyptian thing? claim? Because I think I think it's perfectly okay that the Rosetta Stone is in the British Museum. It should stay there. And I don't think it's up it to us. To, I don't believe it's up to us to tell the people who live in the borders where these ancient civilizations um, physically exist that they are not the heirs to that civilization. Why not? The reason why, there's a couple of reasons why. One is, it's not up to us to do genetic testing on people and to say, well, you're not actually the genetic heir, and therefore, it's your not, claim is illegitimate. But it's not on the basis it would make that argument. I, I have had so many people write to me since this book has come out and during the research of this book and, and, and make the most racist kinds of remarks uh, along those lines. So that, that's sort of where the conversation quickly It's not racist to say, there are no more, to say there are no more Babylonians. There are uh, no more Assyrians. There aren't any. No one can make a claim saying this is ours. That would be the racist. What I'm Surely the racist claim is the one. Uh, the the irredentist racist we're claim not, is the we're one not that says a we, are, we are these people. It is not anyway. a racist claim. I don't think the, the comments that have been made here at all, but it's racialist in, in a sense that it puts it in a racial context and, 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 and ties the connection um, or, or, the, uh, or the, the legitimacy of the claim to whether or not those people are um, a actual the heirs of that civilization. To me, that sort of falls in the category of there are no Palestinians back in the ancient Arab-Israeli conflict. Well, they, you know, they don't, there is no such thing as a Palestinian, which Golda Meir famously said. I mean, if the Egyptians, there's, so th th there's an important issue here, which is the, civiliz the heirs to those civilizations who physically live among them are ultimately responsible for the care 
of those artifacts. If well, we are trying to convince them that they are not really connected to those things, then they can say, well, we don't care about them, and they'll allow them to d deteriorate and be well, destroyed. And that, and, and I don't think they're as obedient to what we think as that, are they? Pardon me? They're not as obedient to what we say or we think as all that. Well, that's true. That's true too, and happily so. But the, the, if, if we're trying to undermine the sen their sense of connection to that, then that is ultimately a self-defeating uh, uh, way of thinking for all of us who cherish these treasures. Because ultimately, the people in Turkey are going to have to take the most care of the antiquities that are in their physical geographic But what if they space. can't? What if they can't? What if well, before that, and can they I ask can't. a question? Yes, no. That's true. Sure. Well, they, I, they can't. Because and, Sharon and has a, a good story about that. But the question of civilization, and Turkey is a perfect example of this, because what is the civilization that is there? I mean, is it good. Greek? Is it Roman? Is it, uh, is it uh, Ottoman? Is it modern Republican Turkish? Uh, how does one map this thing? If you think uh, that, the, that the Greek things ought to be returned to the with the Greeks, with the Greek civilization, well, it turns out that, of course, for hundreds of years, the southern part of Italy was a colony of Greece, Magna Graecia or Megala Elis, uh, the greater Greece. Mm -hmm. And so those things that are then in the southern part of Italy, ought they be turned to Greece, Greece. because there are Greeks. Now, if there is a southern oh, I can sort ask, of... Sorry, I can ask that very easily. Okay, then they'll let me I go. I'll save on. you some time, perhaps. Uh, okay, well, I'll go on to that. <laughs> you, you answer briefly, but I'll get on to my second... My, I'll, right. I'll get to my second point very quickly. Okay. That if there is some, uh, uh, let's say, racial link between these things, if one can call, if you can... If these things are imprinted with Greekness in some p profound way, and they therefore, on those terms, ought to be with Greeks, Greeks don't only live in Athens, or don't only live in Greece. In fact, Greeks live in London. And so... If there's a claim that they should be in the company of Greeks, Greeks live all around the world. And therefore, these things ought to be all around the world. It is to the benefit on those terms of Greeks that they should be in the company of this where they live. I, do, I, do, I just think that, that th those are kinds and of And what about non-Greeks who live in Greece? Well, I, 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 I promised I was going to make this easy for you. Um, the, the government and people of Greece have never demanded the return of anything except the Parthenon marble, or the remainder of the half of the Parthenon sculpture, wrongly called Elgin. It has to be called Elgin. Under the, under the terms under which Parliament, I think, illegally bought the sculpture. Um, the Elgin family insisted they have to be called that in the collection. It's the Parthenon marble. Can, can we talk why, about why do they only ask for the return of that? Well, first I'll say why they don't ask for the return of anything else. They, because there's one, one reason you, you give, Megalia, alas, um, large parts of Anatolia, what's now Izmir, Smyrna, uh, large parts of Italy, um, and so forth, uh, were, were once part of Greece. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is no museum of civilization anywhere in the world, no museum purported to show how our civilization as humans evolved, would be complete without some Greek artifacts, and the Greeks think that that's excellent. They want there to be Greek sculpture all over the world in diaspora like this. It's just that it makes no sense to have half of a unified piece of sculpture that's a piece of literature as well as a piece of sculpture. Yeah. It tells a story in one place, especially when it comes from what can be reasonably called the National Temple of the Greeks. Now, the national, remember how they the, national the national temple, temple, the national temple of the people of Egypt, is not the pyramids. No, no, no. Say. It's but the you know national how temple of ancient Egyptian civilization before the Arab and Muslim conquest, right. of which it isn't symbolic in the least. Well, but, you can't but, move but, the pyramids happily, yeah. so that's all right. But, but, the, but the point of the National Temple <laughs> of Greece is extremely important. Christopher's book is powerful on this. Uh, but you have to remember that uh, the, the history of this of this uh, this this part this temple. This temple was. Uh, a Greek temple as we think of it today for um, uh, a, a number of years. It was for equal number of years a, a, a church, a Christian church. It was for equal number of years um, a, a mosque. It was, de it was blown up by the Venetians. The mosque was no longer usable on those terms, so they created a second smaller mosque uh, on the site. When finally the Greeks uh, won independence from the Ottomans, they created a kingdom with a 17-year-old Bavarian king uh, who hired his father's favorite architect, the Bavarian architect, Leo von Klenze, whom you all know from being the center part of Munich, to create the national symbol, the national temple, the Acropolis and the Parthenon. And he gave this great speech in the company of, of the 17-year-old Bavarian king, who said that on, you've, on, the, on this sacred land, we have removed all the emblems of barbarity from it, because the first thing they had to do to create a national temple was to get rid of all the accretions of the Byzantines and of the, of the, of the Ottomans but sure, to 20, create 23, it. please. And so, so when, when these national monuments are made, they are literally made. It's a political act. It's not a, uh, a, a cultural act. It's not an historical act. It's not a scientific act. That was made an historic, 
cent you know, the historic temple of, of modern Greece. After all, it was Athenian. It wasn't, uh, it, you know, it wasn't Spartan. Uh, it wasn't another city-state monument. Jim, it was if, an Athenian the, monument. Yeah, and also it's a temple to a vanished religion. That's also true. Yeah, true. Right. Uh, if the sculptures were in Athens today, you wouldn't suggest that they be removed to another place so they be so they could be shared with the world or shared with other Greeks. Um, you know, the, I think Chris is. I'm all for it. I mean, I you're all for it. Uh, I, I think I think we ought to be arguing. I think we're, we uh, ought to be uh, uh, ought to be ar arguing more about how it is that we can work to share the world's artistic legacy think, with the world. All right, I agree with that, but I think that there's so many self-serving arguments. Uh, that come from the museum world about these issues. I mean, what happened to the Parthenon? Uh, it's all very genteel and very and very civilized today, but what happened at the time was a really uh, violent act, actually. I mean, you had Lord Elegant's people hacking the sculptures off the top. You see along the rim of the building, which is now empty, they've all been taken down because of the pollution. They can't be outside anymore. But the, the metopes, were, they were hacked out, and this was actually, you could, there's no really valid legal argument, but you really, there are legal people who like to argue about it because it seems pretty clear if you read that the permit that was given him at the time, that he absolutely breached the limits of it. He was supposed to take the sculptures that were on the ground, and from day one, they started hacking at the building. I think if, you, we, if we don't kind of bring those parts of history into the open, you can't really talk honestly about what is the right thing to do with these, it, with these sculptures today? We all, we all believe that we should preserve them. We all believe that we should share them. We all believe that we want them to be available uh, to as many people as possible. All of those are values that have to be balanced with recognizing history, placing it in context, the integrity of the building itself as a piece of artwork, as a, as a, as a piece of history, and as a symbol of um, what is the, the, what we all look back to in Western civilization as, as the kind of the beginnings of democracy itself. I mean, there, those are all values that have to be balanced, but I think that we can't just pretend that what happened to the Parthenon um, at the hands of colonial uh, empires and uh, a very, um, uh, you know, obsessive lord who was a diplomat and an envoy of the British Empire is it was not a very violent act. But, yeah, we're not just why, why isn't that enough, just to be open? What if all museums just said, you know, gave the complete truth about the acquisitions of they'll, their they'll I don't believe they'll but, do well, it. Let's say they did, though. Would that be enough? And Would that if, sort of solve the... Well, uh, I'm not the, the decider project? here, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's the, the, the place to start. The that's British Museum does argument. a very good job of being very clear and transparent about the history of, of these yes. objects. And I have to say that, you know, we have to recognize in, uh, Elgin's associates who, who removed these things, and we don't have the, the, the actual firm and the actual document we've got, as, as Chris reproduced in the book, that we've got the Italian translation that's held privately by a British citizen. So we don't, we're not really close enough to understand what the original document was and what license it was given to his associates. But they just didn't do this overnight. I mean, this took weeks and weeks. There's Four nothing years. surreptitious about this thing. Four you know? years. Of and so if, there, if they wanted this not to happen, if somebody wanted this not to happen, it could have been prevented. You know, this yes. wasn't something that just the, was stolen the, what, away. What the Greeks pointed out there is that uh, Athens at th that point was under foreign occupation. Yeah, by, part of the Ottoman by, Empire. By, author by Turkish authorities who yeah. regarded it as a rather backward, right. a rather backward province and certainly for the most part didn't care oh. about the, the Greekness of the heritage. So but they were legitimately the Ottomans. Uh, the, uh, Greece has some years to go before it's independent. Uh, legally, yes. Um, but th that's why it does matter, I think, that it's very clear that Elgin uh, over-interpreted, over shall we say, uh, the terms of what he'd been allowed to take away. Some, some, some stones, some small stones of little value, I think, are the ones that are mentioned. Um, those, then, of course, he, he, the boat on which he takes them back to England gets sunk. The first that, shipment yeah. sunk, yeah. That could have been all she wrote. So as it happens, it's, it's possible to, to recover yeah. this boat. It might very well which, not have been. Which is why I, I argue uh, for the distribution of things, uh, because you want to distribute the risk to them. If they were all in one place, be that one place London or, or Berlin in 1945 or, or New York in 9-11 or, or yeah. Baghdad or, or Kabul today, you're concentrating the risk, the risk to, of their extraordinary destruction, destruction of a great deal of them, is great. If you distribute them around the world, you distribute the risk in this I, I, case for the preservation. I've already said that I agree with you about that, as do the government and people of Greece. They want a, a Greek diaspora of sculpture. But I, I, I can't think that I really understood you correctly when, or that you understood Sharon's question correctly, when she said if the 
whole sculpture of the Parthenon was now in Athens, and had never been, that you would still be in favor of halving it, of partitioning it and taking if half it, it to well, Bloomsbury? In, in, no, well, in, in this case, uh, first of all, you know, the, 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 the place was a wreck and a ruin before Elgin came to it. But let's assume that it was pristine and everything that was made for it was still on it. No one would ever argue for its removal from, uh, from, an, uh, from a, uh, an architectural monument. Uh, you would argue instead for portable objects to be shared and distributed. So that's to clarify. But, but in this case, well, like this, it was common, never... Uh, the come in uh, uh, splendor, you know, the yeah, exhibition. Uh, that's anything constantly that's, on the move. Yeah, anything that's mobile and portable, absolutely. But in this case, the hypothetical is, you know, is only that. I mean, it had not been an entire monument for a thousand years yes. before Elgin. It had been in a, a, in a ruin for 200 years before Elgin, for sure. But it had been a yeah, church, it had been a mosque, yes. it had been all kinds and of a, things. And an arm stump, which blew up. Yeah. Yeah. The, of course, the, the Duveen Gallery in, in the British Museum was hit by the Nazis yeah. and destroyed the day after the marbles yeah. had been moved into the London Underground system. Yeah. So this, they were just, they very nearly yeah, all blown up. There's in, no in safe place. And of course, that's they why were, they shouldn't be only in one place. Of course, all their patina and veneer was removed by being cleaned with wire brushes. Uh, barbaric acts. Not, not the British all Museum has never. Um, something like 20% of the The British Museum has are. never been able to give a, a decent account of the way it vandalized the marbles while they were in its care. So th it's, a, it's a very, the more you examine the British case that, that, that they helped to save them by taking them away, the more shabby that case becomes. Let, let's move on to another more portable piece. Um, let's look at slide 15, and uh, maybe Sharon could talk a bit about this and yeah. uh, what's involved. Yeah, here. just to show you that, I, that, that this is a pretty complicated question, and um, I myself am not uh, on one side of the issue or the other. This is a story that I tell in the book about the return of um, a cache of beautiful gold and silver objects from the Lydian civilization. It's referred to as the Lydian Horde. And uh, I'll just try to give you a, a very summarized story. It's wonderfully colorful yarn. But basically, um, there, it, there was uh, a cache of about 360 pieces that were dug up and smuggled out of the country and sold to the Metropolitan in the 1960s and kept in their storerooms and never acknowledged because they didn't quite, you know, they were waiting in, to see if they could kind of uh, guided quietly into their collection without anybody noticing. This was at a time when these kinds of things went on much more commonly than they do today. And there was a, a Turkish journalist who's a character you'll meet in the book if you read it, Osgan Najar, who had heard about this and there were some leaks of this that had been out in the Times of London. And he spent um, 16 years dogging this story, 16 years going back to the town, uh, the small one-horse town called Ushak in central Anatolia, asking about it. Nobody would talk to him. Nobody would talk about it. Little by little, they opened up. He's a political journalist. He did this in his spare time. And then he actually was posted to New York, or he'd be, I think he became a freelance journalist and moved to New York and would visit the Met all the time. To, uh, occasionally to see if these pieces would ever show up on display because he could never get uh, an answer out of the Met as to whether they had this cache uh, called the Lydian Horde or not. And uh, in, in fact, in 1985, he was visiting the museum and saw that they, he saw pieces that he recognized because he had, by that point, he'd already made very good contacts and good friends with the townspeople of Ushak and they had described the pieces to him so he knew exactly what he was looking for. And they were on display labeled uh, East Greek Treasure, which is not actually what they were. They're from the Lydian civilization, which is, um, precedes the Greeks. But anyway, he flew back to Turkey, took the evidence to the, Greek culture, to the Turkish culture ministry, and Turkey actually sued the Met for having illegally bought smuggled treasures. So this became a cause celebre. It was the first major case, a suit, lawsuit under American law of a major American cultural institution. During the course of discovery, they found that, in fact, the Board of Trustees at the Met knew perfectly well, you could tell from the notes of their meeting, that they were buying something that had been smuggled. So before anything went to uh, court, the Met cave, they gave the Lydian Horde back, and it uh, was returned to Turkey with great fanfare, lots of parties. The president himself opened the box and big press conference. Children drew cartoons. They made balloons. Lots of people started suing, for <coughs> uh, asking for stuff back as a result. It was on display, the Lydian Horde was on display for two years in Ankara before being sent back to this town of Ushak. History is beautiful where it belongs. This was a slogan that came, that, that was sort of widespread in Turkey that Ozgan Ajar uh, made popular. And this is the uh, masterpiece, uh, or one of two masterpieces of the Lydian Horde. It's a uh, golden hippocampus. It's this big. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. And in 2005, 
uh, a 2006 a story came out, a small story came out of the Turkish press that the masterpiece of the Lydian Horde, which by the way, that's an image that is printed every day on the front page of the Ushak daily paper. So it's become a symbol of the city and it's on their tourism brochure and everything, um, that this masterpiece had been stolen from this one room museum in Ushak and that uh, who was suspected in the theft but the director of the museum himself, we have the slide, I don't know if we can find him, but there's a picture of a guy in front of a glass case. That's uh, uh, Kazim. That's 16. 16, Kazim, Kazim Abkikoglu, there he is, thank you. Uh, the director himself, that's him show, is standing in front of the case. Um, as you can see, the, it's, uh, I don't know if you can see, but the, the lock at the very far left is probably not as good as the, lo is the lock on my high school locker. Let's look at 18 to see the lock. <laughs> oh yeah, can we see it? No, that's, yeah, yeah, that's the lock. <laughs> Those are, the, those are also two bracelets, also from the Lydian Horde. Anyway, Kazim was the guy who had gone to New York. He was deposed and he explained how it was so important that these treasures come back to Turkey because they were part of their cultural identity and absolutely had to be back at home where they were taken from. Kazim got divorced. He ran up a lot of debts. He started gambling. He started holding parties in the museum with dubious ladies and then he ended up... Uh, Sounds like the Getty. Yeah, it's a little bit like, like the, the Getty. Getty's music. chapter 10, different one. Yeah, yeah, toga parties at the Getty, yeah. So... Uh, Anyway, as you can see, anyway, he replaced it with a counterfeit thinking nobody would find it, would find out, but in fact that one's about 10 grams heavier than the original, so guess what they found out? Cosm's now in jail, the hippocampus has disappeared, the Met's been embarrassed, everybody loses. That's, the, that's what sometimes happens when we return <coughs> stolen treasures to countries that are not really um, uh, capable of taking care of what they have. So that's just a small morality tale to counterbalance the, um, you know, post-colonial indignation that some of us may have over what we should return or not return. There's the, rea there's the realities of um, exhibition, preservation, curation, and, what, and, and, and the things that the great museums can do that countries that don't have the same resources may not be able to do. Is it worth the risk? Is it worth the risk? What do you think? Yeah, <laughs> I think it is. Why is that? Uh, well, if, uh, given the, this one condition that uh, I didn't get universal agreement upon earlier um, is, <laughs> is taken into consideration, or, or, or if this condition can be satisfied, which is its, it's emotional meaning to the people involved. Um, very recent example would be we actually within the United Kingdom, uh, the Stone of Schoon, spelled Scone. It's a, a historic coronation stone uh, on which would kneel the kings of Scotland, when Scotland was an independent country. It was taken by English conquerors to Westminster Abbey and used, used in the coronation of British kings from then on, and English kings. Um, it was stolen just before the, the coronation of our present queen um, by some Scottish nationalists and, and taken away, but was recovered by the police and brought back. Under a recent British government, it's been re returned to Scotland and it's, it, it's part of the appurtenances of the new semi-autonomous Scottish Parliament. That seems to me to make absolute sense. It means something to them. It has a continuous presence in their history. Um, people will, would always have felt it unnatural for it to be colonial or conquered property. Do you think it's I a see. good thing they gave the Lydian Horde back, even though it was stolen? Well, I mean, you I make you make it one. you make it hard for one to say that enthusiastically. Yeah. Mm. Incidentally, <laughs> no, see, but see, I would take even. A, yeah, I'd could take I just ask what what is the epoch of that jewelry? Um, it's about twenty five hundred years old. Yeah. It's really, it's yeah. very, very beautiful. The, the, it's, and it's also one of the many civilizations that lie beneath the soil of Turkey that really doesn't have a connection to modern day Turkish culture at all. Yeah. But, but that's why I would take a, a contrary view. I mean, I, think, I, 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 I do think uh, th there's great empathy f for uh, the return of things to people for whom those things still have great meaning. In fact, in this country, we've, we've passed a law to, to require museums to do that. It's called NAGPRA, National, uh, the Native American Grave Repatriation Act. So sacred uh, things and, and human remains, mostly in natural history museums, have been given back to Native Americans when it can be proved, in fact, that there is a connection between those people. And that's partly because there's a, a living relationship with those things. Uh, the problem in most, uh, with most ancient uh, cultures uh, around the world is that these things, Sharon mentioned that there's, it's, th there isn't a living relationship with these things. There may be some national political pride in the return of these, 
that political pride would probably be felt by those in the dominant uh, uh, p political position in Turkey. I don't think the Kurds in Turkey, for example, would feel that same way. And when we identify something as Greek or Italian or Turkish or whatever... Though they've been there longer you know, than the Turks have. Yeah. The Kurds, yeah, yeah. for sure. So you, you run into this problem of ethno-nationalism, of something that is defining of a national culture on the basis of the dominant power. So uh, if, if there were an immigrant, and that immigrant, let's say, came from Central Asia, who wasn't Turkic, uh, but he came from someplace in Central Asia, or let's say it was an African, would he feel the same way toward these things or to other kinds of things? I think we're to be very careful about racializing, uh, as Christopher said earlier, racializing this thing. It's, a, it's a, the political construct of what is cultural property. It's not a, a, a scientific one. It's not a racial one. It's whatever those in power in Turkey feel to be their property. They don't do the same they, uh, with the Kurds, for example. You know, that, 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 that isn't important to what it means, the power in Turkey thinks it means to be Turkish. Hmm. What about looting? Looting seems to be it's really the, at the heart of this whole thing when it comes to more modern works. <clears throat> How do you prevent looting? Restitution, uh, does that stop looting or a bar on trade? <clears throat> of yeah, well, I think, um, how do you stop looting? It's a very good question. And that, that's really been the subject of these lawsuits that we've seen uh, over recent, more recent, when I say recent, over things that were taken over the past 40 years, including the Lydian Horde. That's the, the kind of lawsuits that we've seen that Italy has filed against uh, the Getty criminal charge. And what's not really a lawsuit, what they've done actually is played much more uh, hardball than just a lawsuit against an institution. What they've done is they have criminal charges that are against uh, a former curator herself. So you have one curator, Marion True, who's still, uh, still, 19. Today, still today on trial for charges of fraud and ha things having to do with uh, having acquired stolen antiquities for the Getty. So you have a career curator, Harvard educated, spent 24 years as an esteemed member of the art, um, uh, art and academic um, community did lots of great things for Greece and Italy as their partner and as somebody who had d devoted her life to that, so now finds herself on criminal trial for having not lined her own pockets, but for having essentially done her job the way she believed was acceptable by the norms of the time, more or less. And um, so the Getty, and, and this was done very consciously by the Italian government as leverage to get the Getty to return pieces that they wanted back. So um, it was part of a campaign to stem looting and smuggling from, uh, from Italy itself. And I think that it has succeeded in stopping museums essentially from, from buying antiquities. I think <coughs> the antiquities collecting is down to a trickle at most major museums. You can counter that's that true. if you think that's, that's not true. true. It's from, certainly true at the Getty, statistically speaking. Um, and I think it has stemmed looting in yeah. Italy. And the question is, is there another way other than, because her, you know, Marion True's life is really ruined, her career is ruined, her, her re reputation is over, she lost her job, and she's mm. financially um, ruined as well. So uh, I, I, that seems to me a particularly sad outcome for uh, a fight over 2,000 or, two, you know, 2,000 year old objects, it seems very, 2,200 year old objects, very, very sad, and, there, and isn't there another way? But it has done looting, and at the same time, looting is still absolutely rampant, rampant in Iraq, in um, uh, places like Albania, where there's very little supervision, um, places like Bulgaria, where it has lots and lots of untouched um, places where Greek treasures can be found. Uh, so looting goes on because people want beautiful stuff and they always will and there are measures to stem it but I don't think you can ever cut it off completely. Well, what about countries like Turkey where looting continues and to some degree also in Italy? <clears throat> does, does that somehow negate their rights to demand things back if they can't keep track of their own stuff? Well, I think so, actually, yeah. I think if they, can't keep tra if they can't control looting in their own country, then I think that they completely undermine their own argument that they ought to have things returned to them. That's my first yeah, opinion. Yeah, I, 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 I want to underline and emphasize that with reference to um, the behavior of the Turkish authorities in occupied Cyprus. 
um, in the island of Cyprus, the, the, what they call the footprints of civilization, the traceable evolution of different humans, so is uh, as long and continuous. It's an archaeologist's paradise, almost as good as China in that respect. You can see thousands of years proceeding in an orderly way after one another. And um, after the illegal Turkish invasion and occupation of the northern tier of the island in 1974, a huge number of mainly Greek, but also some Armenian Orthodox churches with wonderful icons and uh, um, in systematically, in a very organized way, just denuded. That anything of value has just been amputated um, and taken out and turns up on the open market. The government of Cyprus, where it can, tries to buy these things back. It's rather humiliating. Sometimes prosecutions can be and have been brought. But in, it really, it's, it, it's an international disgrace because all of this is being done under the cover of law um, by an actual recognized government it's a member of the United Nations, a candidate member of the European Union, and a member of NATO. Mm. I think it should be subjected to sanctions for doing this. Mm. I mean, I, I, the looting is a very complicated uh, situation because, as, as Sharon says, as, as Christopher says, it's not, you know, it, looting is not an, an idle pastime. I mean, it isn't a, a couple of people with those metal detectors out there, you know, on holiday. Uh, and it, it's not a choice that one makes, you know, am I going to be a doctor or a looter? You know, it's... <laughs> it's uh, it, it, it's, it's typically because there are failed circumstances in which one lives. It's either because your life has been ruined by warfare, sectarian violence, by poverty, by corruption. Uh, you're eking out a living in some certain way. The looters themselves are not being rewarded uh, as, you know, the, the, uh, the organized crime people are who take from the looters and so forth. So we have to realize that, that stopping it at the borders, uh, policing the site, growing an alternative economy, all these things are very, very important to stop this. And, and no one condones looting. It's the destruction of knowledge. It'll never be restored. Once these things are wrenched from the ground, you've lost any knowledge that, that could be gained from the context in which they would have been found and excavated. But there once was a practice that encouraged scientific excavation, uh, and that was called partage. And that was, comes from the French word meaning sharing of things. And from the latter part of the 19th century through the first half of the 20th century, foreign excavating teams, mainly from Europe and North America, would provide scientific expertise, financial resources, employment lo locally. They would excavate, document the excavations, and share the finds with the local authorities. This is the way by which the collections uh, at the University of Pennsylvania Museum, at the University of Chicago Museum, many of the collections of the Metropolitan, the British Museum, and in, in Berlin, uh, the Musée Guimet in, in Paris are reformed, but not just outside the found, the, the, the source countries. It's also how the Baghdad Museum was created, the Kabul Museum, the Cairo Museum. The local collections were also built the same way. With the rise of nationalism at the end of the Ottoman Empire first, and then at the end of the Second World War secondly, partage is all but stopped because there's a national claim, a political national claim on these antiquities as being national cultural property. And that has prevented or discouraged in any case the scientific excavation of, of these sites and certainly the sharing of these sites and has concentrated the risk to the found material, again, as I said earlier, in one place, be it Baghdad, be it Kabul, uh, wherever it might be. So I think the rest restoration of partage, which would run counter to the nationalist um, resurgence, but the, rest, the, 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 restitu or the return of partage would be extremely important in this. Well, then you must be, I mean, I, 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 I do agree with you, and I, I was going to point out myself that the Iraqi National Museum was only made possible because of British colonialism. Mm -hmm. right. It's Gertrude Bell's idea. The Iraqis right. didn't have a national museum, didn't think of themselves as having a national museum, or even a patrimony to them. Right. Um, but then you must surely be in favor of the idea of, of, a, of a, a museum of the Acropolis. In which, as far as, in which, as far as possible, everything featuring to uh, having to do with the pertinence of said building and so on is, with the cooperation of the British government, made available to all. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a classic instance of what you recommend? Uh, I, I think it's the reverse of what I recommend. The British Museum would be a co-sponsor. Well, yeah, well, but it's, it's, all, it, but it's returning these things to one place rather than sharing these things between places. I'm arguing for sharing these things between places, not returning them to a single place. I think, you know, I, 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 first of all, I've heard a lot of people talk about the restoration of partage. Um, I, I can't really think of, um, that that's a bad idea, except that, except that it looks backwards. And I think that we have to look forwards. We're in a very different world today than we were in the How 19th century and the 20th century. Well, partage is, is a... Is Archaeology is looking backwards, surely. <laughs> 
Well, good point. It's one of the least forward-looking professions. <laughs> <laughs> you got good a good point. dig in there. I mean, in the, in the United States, it always sounds good to say, no, we should uh, put this behind us and move on and think of the future. So, <laughs> not with, but yes, but not with archaeology. <laughs> not with archaeology. Yes, okay, that's true, and that's funny, but what we're really talking about is... What we're really talking about, about is possession and museums. What no, no, no. We're, we're talking about access, not possession. It no, could we're be talking own, it about cartage has to do with possession. No, no, it has to do with access. These things could be lent. They don't have to be I understand owned. that, but the concept of partage has to do with who gets to keep the stuff. No, no who shares it? Partage means to share, but the practice was when... Um, but when, looking when forward, we can talk about sharing. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what my point is that we can take, we can bring the, the good uh, aspects of what worked about partage right. and incorporate that into new policies as we think about different ways of possession or different arrangements that will allow us to share more instead of being on opposite sides of a tug of war, which is kind of where we're at now with lawsuits and all that kind of thing happening and people going to jail or the threat of going to jail or the threat of uh, suspending excavation permits. But I don't believe that looking backwards to it, as I've had many conversations, you know, with the heads of, of the great museums, and we have talked about this on other panels as well, about uh, the ideals of the Enlightenment and what, museum, what the great museums are really about, a universal museum. I, I think that we have to find new paradigms and new language to talk about what is the right thing to do with antiquities and how to treat them and how to share them in a global world in the 21st century. That's my only point. I agree. And not to put you even more on the spot, uh, I have to ask about your collection at the Art Institute of Chicago. Are there any claims no. on any of your items? No. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I guess I could be uh, funny, but probably dangerously so, and to say that that's an indication that we had not been as uh, ambitious uh, a, a builder of collections in the first part of the 20th century. Uh, but it is the case that we don't have uh, claims uh, uh, against anything. Hey, except when the French are going to ask but for the Syrah back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would you explain what that is? The Grand Jat, which is a, a painting that was acquired by trustees of the, of the Art Institute of Chicago in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, it, how it can, you know, it would now not be possible to uh, remove that painting from France because France has a, a law that uh, would uh, claim it as, as French cultural property. It, it didn't then. Uh, it this isn't anything that was, uh, again, looted or surreptitious. It's just uh, it was allowed to be purchased. Uh, there, are, there are reasonable laws of that are th uh, for the regulation of cultural property in the world. Britain has a, a very good one. Uh, and right now there's the great case, of course, of the, of the Titians. Uh, with the Duke of Sutherland and with the National Gallery and the National Galleries of Scotland uh, together trying to buy this for their, and to share between those museums. But if there's a, a, a work of art that's judged by um, a, a panel of British authorities to be of great value to Britain, uh, it can prevent the export of that object. Uh, let's say that I wanted to buy it. I wanted to buy it for $10 million. They could hold export license for a period of time. That period of time is variable. Let's say it's six months, a year, whatever it might be, uh, uh, allowing the, a British museum or a consortium of British museums to raise that equivalent amount of money, that $10 million, for it to be returned, to remain within Britain. Uh, so that, so that they, that, that's a, a kind of, a, it's not a retention law or it's not an open export law. It's something in between. Japan has a very uh, 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 interesting um, uh, law as well, by which it categorizes objects as highest um, uh, national treasure, national treasure, you know, near to national treasure, would like to be national treasure, whatever they might be, you know, going all the way down this thing, they want to be national treasure. And it'll, it'll, it doesn't allow the highest category of thing to be exported in Japan, but allows percentages of each and greater percentages as you decline down the thing. So they do want there to be uh, a diaspora of Japanese uh, objects in the world, but they also want the right to claim a portion of them as important to Japan. What are your policies on acquiring artifacts? Uh, uh, well, the first thing we have to do is we have to uh, inquire deeply into the provenance of the object because we have to um, uh, adhere to national laws. Uh, and so we have to make sure, we, first we have to get as much information we can from the person who's offering it to us, whether it's a dealer or whether it's a collector or something. We know how did this object come into their possession? How did it come into this country? Tell us all you can about the show us all the documentation you have on that. We then have to try to decide from which country it might have come and then try to contact those people. We have to look through the databases for stolen property. We do all this research. Um, it has, uh, to, be, to, to confirm what Sharon said, it has had a chilling effect 
on the acquisition of antiquities in this country. It hasn't had a consequent benefit to stopping looting in the world, but it has prevented objects, undocumented objects, or insufficiently documented objects from coming into public collections in this country. They've gone elsewhere, elsewhere, uh, n not in Britain, not in many places in, in Europe, but uh, in, the, in the Middle East, in the Far East. Uh, these things are, are being looted, they're going somewhere, but they're not coming into public collections because private it's... Private collections are going. Well, they're... I don't even think they're coming to many really private know, collections actually. in this country. Has to be, yeah, I don't think private collections in this country no, anymore. I mean, in but I, I mean, I was in the uh, per, I was in the Arabian Gulf in Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates recently, and it's just a it's a free it's a it's it's a wild wild west over there. You can buy whatever you want. There were um, in the main hotel in Abu Dhabi. This it's a five billion dollar hotel called um, the Emirates Palace. There's just uh, get, um, vitrine after vitrine, uh, an obscene number of antiquities for sale by actually a dealer based in Beverly Hills. But I, I spoke to some art experts while I was there because I was so shocked by what I saw. I took pictures of all of them because I, every imaginable civilization. But um, the conclusion was this stuff has to be fake because there was so much of it. It was just absurd. But maybe some of it's fake, some of it's not. But in any event, it was actually on display in the lobby of, of the most of the sort of the marquee uh, center of the social world of Abu Dhabi. And there are constantly little news uh, releases of a shipment of smuggled art uh, intercepted at the Dubai customs and that kind of thing. When I was actually when I was in Turkey interviewing the the uh, minister of Mo museums and monuments. He had just gotten a whole shipment of stuff that w had come from Turkey, had was stopped in Dubai. He gave me this whole sheaf of photographs of antiquities that had been smuggled out of Turkey from Dubai. And I said, well, you know, why do you think it was in Dubai? He said, I really, I don't know. And <laughs> they just seem because, very yeah, clueless about it, very uh, strange. It's an entrepot. Um, Nina Burley's yeah. just done a very interesting book about the industrialized faking of antiquities mm -hmm. um, in the Holy Land, in, in, in Israel, Palestine, mm -hmm. where Interestingly, often the motive for faking it is not just financial, but it is to try and establish um, a nationalist or racist mm. uh, or religious claim. In other words, mm. here, is, here is this box of remains that says the Jesus family <laughs> on it. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that, that was, I mean, actually I think the New York Times almost fell for that story um, by the year or so ago. Um, this shows, this shows that, this shows that, shocked and appalled. This shows that King, this shows that King David was a real person which means we can build a settlement somewhere mm -hmm, else, um, mm -hmm, etc. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So there's, there's a sort of triple layer of corruption uh, attached to it. Mm. It also shows how gullible people are. Interesting. But I, yeah. I suppose we knew that. Yeah, no, I think it's a, I, I sort of something I became aware of as I was traveling through um, the ancient world was how much uh, collecting, excavating, and um, displaying artifacts is so closely tied to the nationalist, to the national narrative, whatever that's meant to be. And I, it made me wonder uh, how much gets ignored in the excavation process as not serving kind of the national myth, whatever the national myth might be. Uh, and that, d I, I don't know the answer to that question, but it did occur to me as I was uh, reading about the Hittites and the Hittite pact between the Hittites and the Egyptians and how the um, Israelite nation also uh, had an alliance there. And I just thought, gee, I never saw that reflected in any of the museums that I've seen in Egypt or in Israel for that matter. And I thought, well, probably it's not very convenient for the national narrative of each of those countries today. Mm -hmm. So that's something else to kind of think about. Al always bearing in mind also that every artifact in the Kabul National Museum, the Afghan National Museum, in, in the same week as the demolition of the um, Bamiyan Buddhas, Bamiyan Buddhas uh, was destroyed on purpose because it mm -hmm. didn't fit with the mm -hmm. Islamic concept of what a national patrimony would be. This, this stuff was by definition profane mm -hmm. because it didn't reflect uh, the prophet. Mm -hmm. um, so, but thankfully they were saved. An, uh, that's another reason why I think um, we're, 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 one always has to qualify this idea of are we dealing with Assyrians or not, or just people who live where Assyria used to be. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good time to go to some questions. <clears throat> and the, the key thing is to go to the mic, because otherwise you won't be heard um, or recorded. So I think we'll set up the mics there. And if you could just come up, and as always, keep the questions brief and in the form of a question. Um, <laughs> we'd be very appreciated. Uh, and if maybe we could, um, yeah, we took off the slide. Good. Okay, since you got there first, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'd like your 
a panel to, to answer uh, or comment on the looting that was done in Baghdad when the American troops entered. Anybody want to? Uh, I was actually in Baghdad uh, for, I used to work at the Washington Post, at the, shortly after it, the Baghdad Museum was looted. And uh, it's been very hard to get the story straight because the story that was put out at the time was the, the 120,000 pieces were stolen and that was the entirety of the Baghdad collection. Uh, Matthew Bogdanos, the American colonel who was sent then to kind of set things right, um, has done a very good job of explaining what actually happened. There are, uh, to my knowledge, still about four to 5,000 pieces that have not been returned, in fact. So, so it was some, some much, it's a much smaller number, all, still a horrible number, a couple of you know, 20,000, something like that, pieces. Many of the most valuable pieces were uh, thought stolen, it turns out, were actually saved by the museum staff and hidden in a bank vault. Um, as, by the way, as was also the case in Kabul, um, the, I just visited this beautiful exhibit of the Bactrian Horde that was saved by these heroic, heroic um, museum staff in Kabul. Also, they put it at the risk of their own lives under the Taliban in, the, uh, Afghan, in an Afghan bank. But in any event, the main problem, uh, so, so th there are still about four to 5,000 pieces that are missing, some of them very uh, valuable and um, uh, 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 singular pieces of that museum, to, to my knowledge. But the bigger problem, I, I spoke recently about the book in Washington, and the Iraqi ambassador came to that talk. And he, he said, he confirmed to me what I've heard for also from um, archaeologists and such, which is that the looting going on in Baghdad, in Iraq generally, is not having to do with the museum, but is extremely destructive and, and, and rampant and uncontrolled right now. Uh, I have uh, two questions on a related topic, uh, deterrence. First, uh, you mentioned uh, obliquely about punishments and uh, making looting a crime. I was wondering if you could um, talk about that a little more and uh, do we need to raise the stakes to deter looting um, with punishment? And secondly, are there any mechanisms that exist to reward looting? That is to say, uh, give rewards to uh, would-be looters to keep uh, treasure or um, uh, archaeological finds in situ. Thanks. Just, this would be like giving poppy farmers something else to grow, that kind of thing. <laughs> well, there's an awful lot of money out there from museums and philanthropic organizations to preserve. Yeah. yeah. Uh, archaeological finds. So well, I, was, I, 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 do I don't know that, if there's any mechanisms out there that exist like well, that. Well, yeah, no, I think that that's an important part of what we were talking about earlier as a, as a uh, part of the solution to the problem is to create alternative economies because this is a real economy in certain situations. So obviously there are means of doing that. It's on a scale and it involves, uh, you know, the investment of governmental uh, resources, not museum resources, you know, not, but the scale is so great it would be on governmental or non-governmental organization resources, but certainly that's part of it. To the question of uh, uh, upping the um, uh, sort of penalties on looting as a, as a disincentive, uh, it, it generally is, and I probably is always uh, uh, everywhere, against the law to loot. It's certainly against the law to, to remove, uh, in some cases against the law to own privately, in some cases against the law to, to export. Uh, but there, uh, even in, where, in, the, in places where the penalties are the greatest, punishable by death in China, for example, there's still looting going on. People still take risks when they think there's a benefit to them to take that risk. I mean, people can, you know, uh, commit all kinds of crimes uh, in this country because they think they won't get caught, whatever the penalty might be. So I don't know that penalty by itself is sufficient. I think it's an integrated uh, uh, regime of, of carrots and sticks that's going to make it work. The other thing is, is that there's no uniformity of penalties. So, uh, and it's wielded often for political reasons, as Jim has pointed out, as in the case of Marion True, there you have some very uh, ambitious prosecutors who've taken laws that have been on the books in Italy that had, ne had not been enforced uh, pretty much forever and have wielded that, you know, very aggressively <coughs> against, for example, Marion True. But the, what what is also the case is that there is just a patchwork everywhere, and there is no international law. There's no kind of consistency. To, for people to either, um, you know, adjudicate disputes or to know what the what the penalties might be overall, and this and it's so it makes it hard because, you know, for example, you now have Egypt trying to pass a law 
that would allow it to prosecute people the same way that Italy has been and that Greece has kind of done pretty sort of half-heartedly. So um, you don't really, you don't want to be tried in the Egyptian judicial system, I, I promise you. On the side. Yes, um, over the Christmas holidays, I went to Cambridge, the Fitzwilliam Museum, to see um, an extraordinary um, gold jewelry, which had been excavated in an area called Vani, which is now in the state of Georgia. Um, it, it was an amazing, extraordinary exhibit. At any rate, they said uh, that at the end of, it's going to go to Greece and then it's going to go to um, Los Angeles, but after that it's going back to Vani. Did those people have a place where it can be kept safe and share it with the rest of the world? I mean, do they have a, a, a good system for antiquities there? In, in Georgia? I've never been to Georgia. I really, I don't know. I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> so there's, well, there's, there's a, a, a so there's so many incredible treasures in the area of the former Soviet Union. Uh, some of it, some of it all dates from the colonial period when they took things for their own national museums themselves. Some of it is dates from World War II, and has to do with the stuff that Hitler spent a lot of his time gathering up, or that the, um, very angry Soviet troops sort of took in triumph back you know, to, to the motherland, and that Germany wants back from Russia. So you have all kinds of restitution battles between Germany and Russia today that has to do with uh, objects that originated in neither country. So, but I don't know about the Georgia Museum. Without knowing about that part of the Caucasus, it sounds as if they got one idea very clear, which is it's nice to share and send things on the circuit. And if they don't have such a system now, well, we've got to get, assume that they are as capable as anyone else of developing one. And it's clearly they respect their patrimony. So I think the answer is provisionally yes. It looks as if they, it looks as if they are on the right track. I mean, would, anyway, the there's, no, there's no way of, um, it, they won't get one unless they're allowed to handle it themselves. Put it like that. Thank you. I got a sense of uh, how art museums are being sensitive about what they may acquire now. Uh, what sort of responsibility do you think the art auction houses have that they don't bring pieces to the market that are hot or otherwise inappropriately acquired? Very good question. I think that the, I think uh, the auction houses have an extremely checkered history of that, and when they get caught then they stop. <laughs> so I think that basically we, you need to have oversight and measures in place that, um, that keep them from, from uh, you know, basically they, you know, they're, they're in business to make money. And so if they get a beautiful object, you know, for years and years they would sell the objects of uh, Robin Symes, for example, the guy who was involved with a lot of the Getty purchases who has who was kind of a, at the top of the art heap in the antiquities world in the 80s and who's now kind of vanished in a puff of smoke. And he worked very closely with the auction houses. And um, so I think that's a very valid point. They, they just have to be uh, monitored and governed like, ev like everybody else because the temptation and the money is so great so that when they get an object that says owned by a Swiss gentleman unnamed, um, that's usually a warning signal that that piece has no provenance and might well have been smuggled, for example. But sometimes it's uh, undisguised. I mean, in the case of the, there's a little church, in, a Byzantine church in Cyprus called Kana Karia, uh, a, a real gem of a place, very famous for its iconography. This iconography was stripped off and turned up just under its own name in an auction house in, I think, Austria, I can't remember. It was a scandal that it should even have been, no, no, no museum would have dreamt of touching such a thing. It was quite clearly stolen property, and it was also a, a terrible desecration, because it, actually these panels were painted to, sh to the shape of a certain part of the church, so they don't make any sense on their own. They're not, they're not really beautiful anymore. Um, like the horse of Cellini, it's on a, a sort of dull plinth in the British Museum. It's supposed to be looked at from below at a certain point on the Acropolis. It's meaningless when it's been denatured. Anyway, I think one of the ways of getting your carrot stick combination better adjusted would be to remove the incentive for looting that is supplied by some of the more promiscuous auction houses. Just say, you know, you won't make money this way. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, you've spoken very well about the issue as it relates to art and architecture. I was wondering if there's any pressure for the return, repatriation of Egyptian mummies. And I ask that because in the United States, when Native American remains are involved, yes. there's intense pressure to either leave alone or return uh, those ancient remains. And it makes a big media splash, but I haven't heard anything about Egyptian or Russian or French claims for... Uh, it's very uh, interesting. I mean, I, I myself, I've had a couple of people, uh, forward thinkers such as yourself, ask me that um, when I've talked about the book. Because there is there's such a debate over Native American remains and, and um, the proper disposition of those remains, I, I've not heard the, a whiff, honestly, of discussion of whether displaying mummies is a desecration of a, of a, a, a corpse or uh, of human remains. Uh, from the Egyptian point of view, I don't know if you, you've read anything of the kind, but I, I've had a couple of young students say, well, shouldn't this be you know, scandalous? And I can't quite wrap my head around that. I mean, a lot, some of these things are 4,000 years old. And um, I mean, in effect, the fact that we're showing uh, King Tut's tomb is a desecration of the ancient Egyptian religion. These things were never meant to be opened and looked at by members of the public. So um, I think that's a discussion that's probably the, uh, another turn of the wheel or the evolutionary wheel, if you like, in terms of how sensitive, culturally sensitive, it's appropriate to be when you're balancing um, knowledge and history and understanding of the arc of human um, civilization. Yes, uh, several years ago I was in Addis Ababa and I was seeing the um, skeletal remains of Lucy and then I later, or I thought I was, and then I later found out that that is actually kept in a vault <laughs> when it's in that museum, mm -hmm. but then it was traveling over to Houston where it would be on public display. So I think this, uh, this um, theme that's come up in this discussion about whether countries actually have a system to, to display things to the public is an important one. Um, in that case, it was great that it was going to travel. But my question was a follow-up on your comment on Abu Dhabi because Thomas Krenz spoke recently at Columbia about the really great infusion of, of uh, money, <laughs> of investment into mm -hmm. the art world. Mm -hmm. I think he said that the government of Abu Dhabi was putting $600 million now into contemporary art purchases and that the Louvre and the Guggenheim and others are starting to do these mega museum projects there. So could you talk a little bit about when you have such a, a very new investment, uh, do you see the potential for more <laughs> to happen in the, in, in the wrong direction as far as what you mentioned you saw in the hotel there? Yeah, I'll, I'll comment. I'd be curious to hear what Jim has to say about this, too. First of all, the, I, I, having just finished a, a big piece on this exact topic, I can tell you that the correct figure in Abu Dhabi is $27 billion okay. is what they're spending to develop museums on Saadiyat Island. $27 that was, yeah, billion. That was just a purchase. Right? $1.3 billion is the Louvre Abu Dhabi alone, and maybe, yeah, that much for, for purchases for the Guggenheim that Tom Krenz <laughs> is working on. But, um, I think having talked to the cultural officials in Dubai and Qatar and Abu Dhabi, they have no sense of any of these issues. I really have that strong feeling. They are creating uh, probably 10 to 20 major world-class museums by world, built by world-class architects in the next five to 10 years. It's gonna be a huge kind of shift in the balance of power or as a kind of a, uh, a place for art and the, the world of art and culture. And um, among those that they're building are so-called universal museums, which it would be similar to, at least in principle, a Louvre. There will be an actual Louvre, of course, uh, you know, British Museum like the Met. And so presumably that means building antiquities collections. I don't think the problem is if you're building contemporary art collections, then they'll just acquire art like everybody else and they'll borrow art, of course, from the Louvre and that kind of thing um, and, and, and benefit from traveling exhibitions. Uh, I don't know if, the, I, I did not get the sense that there's anybody in that part of the world who's thinking about the, the, uh, you know, the sand traps that might await them in trying to create an antiquities collection today. The only comparable museum that has had that kind of ambition has been the Getty in modern times, and they've run into a world of hurt in doing that. So I think that's definitely something to, to that's worth asking about. I don't know. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I think what Sharon said is probably uh, absolutely right. I, I think there are other interesting questions related to it, and that is to do with motivations for this great investment uh, in the arts in that part of the world and of the participating parties in it. Uh, the, the Louvre, as you know, is a part of the cultural ministry of France, and, and it is a, a, a political 
arm of, of the government, as it were. And it was very clear when the cultural minister announced this relationship that the L French wanted the Louvre to be there because they wanted to ha have a player in the game in that part of the world, you know, recognizing that the British and the, and the U.S. were there on other terms uh, at that time, military and economic, let's say. The French wanted to be at the table, and they were going to be at the table on cultural terms, have a presence. It was a, it was a, a, a frank um, statement of the, the politicization of this, uh, and, and of this activity. Uh, when it comes to the Guggenheim, you know, it's part of the business plan of the Guggenheim, as far as I can tell. I, I, don't, I don't know it in detail, but it's, it's, not, it's not for why we might wish that this uh, was happening. We might wish that it was happening because it was going to be bringing the world's cultures, representative examples of the world's cultures together in one place to build uh, understanding among uh, Arab peoples and non-Arab peoples in the world uh, to the greater glory of humankind. Uh, you know, it, it does seem to be that as Christopher said, it's an entrepot. The ambition is to create, from what I understand, people who've gone there to see it, that the people who are coming into the museum or for whom the museum might be built are not local people for the most part. They're, people, they're creating destinations, cultural destinations, tourist destinations, hotels, golf courses, you know, uh, uh, things that are relevant to an entrepot. So I, I think a larger question, in addition to Sharon's questions, is really what is the motivation for doing this? Okay. We'll make this the last question. Thank you. Uh, what are the five antiquities that Egypt would like back from the West, and what are their status about what is the status of them going back? So the Rosetta Stone at the British Museum, the zodiac ceiling which you saw, which is at the Louvre, the bust of Anhof, which we have. But if you want to show, social it, slides. It's at the number six. This. Um, if we're going to show six, we should also show five because it. W it you can see that he's in. Uh, the British Museum of the Boston, sorry, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and was one of the architects of one of the the great pyramids, the second largest pyramid. And then there's, yeah, if we look at five. I think you'll see where he came from. So he was he was taken legally from here um, in a sanctioned um, dig in the 20s, but he would be put back where he was used, was laid to rest in uh, full view of this magnificent monument that he built. Uh, and then there's, and there's of course three major pyramids that everybody knows. So there's the bust of Hamiyunu, who designed the Great Pyramid, is four and five. Nefertiti. I'm okay. missing. Thank you. Bust of Nefertiti is only on the cover of the book, of course. <laughs> <laughs> what a, Instead of a slide, you have the actual. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> nice. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> um, who is in Berlin? And uh, the status of them is. Uh, the official request is that they be loaned for three months for the opening of a new museum, which Egypt so desperately needs that they're building at the foot. Anybody who's been to the Cairo Museum would know that. Uh, they're building it uh, in the, in the re region, in the environs of the pyramids. The um, bust of Anhof, the Boston has said no. Uh, the bust of Hamiyunu, Hildesheim has said yes, they will loan it. The bust of Nefertiti has been deemed too fragile to travel. I don't really believe that, but anyhow, that's what they're saying. Um, I think, but I actually think they might be meeting to discuss it, but they, they're, I don't think they've officially rejected the idea, but they have said it's too fragile to travel. The zodiac ceiling is considered too fragile to travel, and the Rosetta Stone is, um, I think that they're, it's under consideration, is the latest. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon will be downstairs signing books. <laughs> Grab fest that Egypt became in, in the 19th century after Napoleon uh, invaded and conquered and then lost it to the British. And his, his, he had a military purpose, of course, for doing so. But in, in the course of doing that, he, dis he uh, brought ancient Egypt to the eyes of Europe, which hadn't kind of been aware of the, wonder, the wondrous beauty of ancient Egypt that we're all kind of familiar with every day, the Sphinx, the Pyramid. Well, these were, these were very vague notions to the Europeans at that time. So um, just to give you an example of the kind of uh, outrages, essentially, that happened in the 19th century in Egypt, um, I was given access to by, by Egypt's chief archaeologist. His name is Zahi Hawass. If you've seen anything Egyptian, you've seen the guy. He has this Indiana Jones hat, and he's constantly um, very passionately excited talking about all the beauties of Egypt and what they discovered. And it's usually right before some Discovery Channel special starring him on television. But anyway, um, 
apart from the fact that he loves being in the media, he's right. There's a lot of stuff out there that, um, that was taken that was taken in kind of horrifying ways and that we're not aware of it. Aware of it. So he gave me access to all of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings, um, which is where the pharaohs were buried. You probably know that. This particular tomb is the tomb of Amenophis III. It has never been opened to the public. Um, and I took this photograph in pitch black. Love my camera. Um, but you can just see, um, that's the, like, really thanks to digital technology that I was able to get this image. This is, look at how beautiful, and of course this is not the most, uh, you know, if we had light in the tomb, you'd see how vivid the colors are. Amenophis III, one of the great pharaohs, um, and this is him uh, side by side with the various gods, Anubis, etc. And if we can see the next, this slide and then the next one, please. You can see how somebody came into the 19th century and just cut out three of the heads of the pharaoh. Boom, 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 boom. Um, and then let's, we don't know exactly uh, who cut them out, but what we do know is that today, next slide, please, they are in uh, the Louvre. And that is... Writer Christopher Hitchens and Sharon Waxman, who's written a book on lost art, are two of the panelists. This is about an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Kalaga of the New York Times, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Time Center for our eighth annual Arts and Leisure Weekend. Over the next hour, we explore one of the most pressing cultural questions of our time. Namely, where do the great treasures of ancient art rightfully belong? We are privileged to be joined by three renowned experts on this subject, whose work, whether as journalists, authors, scholars, or leaders of some of the world's great art institutions, has done much to shed light on this topic. You will hear much more about these esteemed panelists from our moderator. As a New York Times culture reporter covering classical music and dance, he has reported on everything from the New York Philharmonic's historic trip to North Korea last spring to Elliot Carter's centennial birthday concert at Carnegie Hall last month. This past year, he's also chronicled the exploits of Gerard Mortier leaving New York City Opera, classical music patron Alberto Villar being sent to jail, and on a lighter note, the distracted virtuosi who have inexplicably left their multi-million dollar musical instruments behind in taxi cabs, trains, restrooms, and even front doorsteps. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Dan Waken, and our special guests, James Cuno, Christopher Hitchens, and Sharon Waxman. Everybody. Um, it's good to be here. <clears throat> I've lost my voice this morning, so that means they'll have to talk more than me, hopefully. Cool. Is the, that is the head of one of those three, and all three of them are in the Louvre. You can go see them today. They're in the Sully Wing. So, um, you know, Zahi Hawass has asked for five major pieces back from Western museums, including the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, the Louvre, the British Museum, and two German museums. This is not, these, these heads are not among the pieces that he's asked for, but you just get a sense of um, the feeling of despoliation that uh, Egyptians who are passionate about archaeology and their past feel when, when the subject arises. Let's, let's give another example of that. Number four, please. Amir Sharon, tell us what this shows. So this is actually uh, one of the objects that Zahi Hawass does want back. This is the zodiac ceiling, or that wood, that's the replica, it's a, that black blobby thing in the top is a black plaster cast that the Louvre sent to, the, to Egypt in the 19th century um, after, um, I would say an archaeologist, an adventurer and his agent, uh, uh, Jean-Jacques Saulnier, spent 21 days hacking this ceiling out of the Temple of Dendera, which is this stunning temple that stands in the middle of these marshes. The Nile used to flow right up to it. It's 2,000 it's two years old. Um, and it is one of the earliest recorded uh, zodiacs that we have. So if you were to see it better, um, 
you, well, if you see it as it was actually drawn in situ before it was blasted out of there by Napoleon's scientists who came with it, you could really see, you could see Scorpio and Libra, you can actually see recorded an eclipse at a certain time in about 2000, uh, about, about, um, about just before the birth of Christ essentially. So it's, uh, it's really an amazing piece of history in addition to being an artifact and it's in the today. It took 21 days for the French to hack it out of the, ce uh, out of the ceiling which is on the rooftop of the Temple of Dendera. They finally used um, gunpowder to blast it out and that's how they got the thing to France. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about works of art and artifacts in museums and where they came from, how they got there, and should they stay or should they go. Uh, the, the jumping off point is Sharon's book, Loot, which is uh, sort of a comprehensive look at various issues. Um, and in reading it, I, I came up with sort of two categories of works. One, things that were dug up, torn away, removed in the early 19th century, <clears throat> early 20th century, brought to the great museums in Paris, London, New York, um, and have become part of those museums and sort of part of the fabric of that. Um, the other category are objects that have been found in recent years, things that have been suddenly uh, emerged on the market in 1980, 1990, and find their way into museums and are the subject of a different kind of controversy. So I thought we'd start out with the first category. And we have some slides, and <clears throat> I'm going to show a series of three slides. Um, if we can go through one, two, and three, and then maybe Sharon can talk a little bit about what they are and, and why they're important. Sure. Well, I think to, to put the, the issues of uh, category one and category two, which is uh, objects that were looted or plundered, otherwise uh, appropriated in the past 200 years ago, 150 years ago, are in fact connected to these uh, restitution battles that we're seeing emerge on the front pages or in the culture pages of newspapers and journals and magazines today, which is you, when you have these countries that uh, were the, where these things were dug up, they're called source countries that are now demanding things back. Uh, you have to really go back to the origins of the plunder or of the origins of the creation, the core creation of the great collections of our great museums to understand what's at the heart of this, which is what the book tries to do. So a great example of this is Egypt because Egypt was literally um, there, some people call it the rape of Egypt. There's a wonderful book called The Rape of the Nile by Brian Fagan, one of the early books on the topic, that talk about the, the kind of free-for-all of a, you know, just... Let me ask Jim, um, as a museum director, should these kinds of artifacts be returned to Egypt? Well, well, first I think we have to recognize that history is, an untidy, is untidy and it's a complicated situation. In this case, it's not just that, uh, and I'm, I'm looking down here because we can actually see the images here in front of us, oh, yeah. but uh, it, it's not just that, the, uh, that this period of time in the latter part of the 18th century, early part of the 19th century was a time in which the Europeans became interested in things ancient uh, in Egypt, but it's also at a time in which by virtue of the Europeans becoming interested in those things then, that the local peoples became interested as well. They had lived for centuries then amongst these things, but of course they reasonably believed that the values of their civilization, call it, um, began uh, with, the, with the Prophet, with uh, Prophet Muhammad, and that these pagan artifacts had no relationship to the life they lived or the civilization that they claimed uh, for themselves. So it wasn't uh, it wasn't that this was something that was prized in, as, in, as glory of the ancient uh, uh, of the current Egyptians when the, when the French and the British were there. It was something that came upon later. And in fact, the first, as it were, local history of, of ancient Egypt was written by an Egyptian who had studied in France and got caught up in the kind of fervor of nationalism uh, in, in Paris and sweeping Europe in the middle part of the 19th century. So it is not, it's, history is never so neat and tidy <coughs> as we would like it to be. And these, these questions of restitution are also questions about how and on what terms might we rewrite history? They're based on the premise that uh, uh, there's a way to correct the imbalances, historical imbalances of power. We want to redress them in some way uh, now. So th I, don't, I, I don't think there's a claim for these objects from, and using them generally speaking, um, uh, that, have, that were removed prior to their laws being against their removal. In other words, we can now go back and say this is 180 years before Egypt passed such a law, so there's no legal reason why they might be returned. Is there, is there a moral reason? Uh, that's the question. Is there a moral reason? On what terms might there be a moral reason? Might it be there's a moral reason because there's some 
uh, claim that the modern state of Egypt has.